departure and increase its influence in most of the developing nations. Its largesse has come at huge cost for many of the 138 nations that have signed up to the program. You may remember Sri Lanka couldn't keep up with the payments of the port and eventually had to hand over the facility on a 100 year lease. Many nations have been rethinking their involvement amid accusations China was overpricing road and rail links. Trying to understand just how much money Beijing has lent the world has been a challenge for many. But the Kiel Institute for the World Economy has managed to cut through the opaque lending practices. It says between 2000 and 2017, the world's debt obligations to China rose from $500 billion to a staggering $5 trillion. That's about 6% of the world's economic output. Most of that has been national debt markets. Beijing and its subsidiaries have lent $1.5 trillion directly to 150 nations. That makes China the world's biggest creditor, overtaking the IMF and even World Bank. Beijing has also made unreported loans worth $200 billion, which is worrying as other investors and international lenders can't make accurate investment decisions. Over recent years, Washington has grown reluctant to bail out nations tied to China's initiatives through the IMF and World Bank. Let's bring in the author of that, Professor Christoph Trebesh. Good to have you with us. First of all, what kind Hello. of lender is Beijing? Is it fair to describe it as predatory? I wouldn't uh, use that word. I think um, overseas lending by China can be characterized in three main ways. First, it's state-driven, meaning that uh, it is the government entities who do uh, almost all of the uh, lending overseas. Second, it is opaque, uh, meaning that uh, China and its entities they do not share details on uh, where uh, it lends and at what terms. And third, it is uh, market-based, uh, so despite this being a state uh, lender, uh, the loan terms look rather like uh, private loan terms, so the interest rates are comparatively high, maturities are comparatively short, this is US dollar debt, and there are strings attached, for example, the life of clauses that will guarantee China repayment in case uh, of a default, for example, via oil or copper export proceeds. Do some of those details differ widely from what other world powers might offer, for example, and what you make of Beijing's line that really at the heart of all this is a lot of uh, resistance from other world powers who don't want to see China take its rightful place on the world stage? So I would say what China is doing at the moment is very uh, reminiscent of what rising powers have done in the past. So I do not see many differences there to the rise of, say, the UK in the uh, 19th century or the rise of the US in the 20th century. Um, those rising powers extend their footprint globally by via trade, via finance, and via the military. Um, and China is doing just the same. So it is no surprise that China is, is extending more and more loans uh, and, and is uh, integrating economically and financially with the rest of the world, especially emerging markets. So is taking money from Beijing the problem then compared to taking money from other institutions, if not the world powers, maybe the world bank? So I wouldn't call it a problem. Uh, I would say that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different deal uh, that you get uh, from, from, say, a uh, loan by the world bank or loan by China. China usually uh, lends um, as part of a package where you might get an infrastructure um, uh, construction project that is financed uh, by, with, by a Chinese uh, loans uh, and implemented by Chinese firms and Chinese workers. Uh, and the terms there are market-oriented, right? So they, they have risk premium, they, they are relatively high interest rates. Uh, whereas the World Bank um, does not offer these package deals that it might request uh, you know, political conditions, uh, but uh, the interest rates are usually low, the lending is concessional, so maturity is long. Uh, so these are loans that are easier to pay back than the loans that China offers. All right, well, in addition to that, there is the, uh, the concern over China's hidden debt. Why is that an issue? 
is an issue because uh, for risk pricing, say I'm an investor and I want to buy sovereign bonds of a African nations, then one of the fundamental uh, things I want to know is whether, um, you know, what the debt uh, stock looks like and how much debt is coming due in the coming years. And that information is lacking for many countries with regard to the large Chinese debts. So uh, market risk pricing of sovereign bonds is uh, impaired. Uh, by the lack of transparency, uh, in our view, and uh, also debt sustainability analysis, macro risk analysis. Say, I want to judge uh, the, the likelihood of a uh, financial distress uh, default, then I need to know well, how the debt uh, and the debt view uh, looks like, and that information is lacking uh, for the Chinese debts, and that's a major problem. Is the situation compounded by China's holdings of uh, German euro bonds, U.S. Treasuries, etc.? say that's a bit of a different story so um, the uh, I mean there is also not much transparency with regard to the holdings of China's central bank uh, so we don't know how much exactly of advanced countries that they have been uh, you know purchasing in the past but that's a very different uh, setup because those are market-based instruments and Germany knows very well uh, you know how much debt it has it has sold to the market which was then purchased on secondary market by Chinese uh, entities uh, the, the, the real problem is with these developing country loans that are not picked up by you know any market-based uh, institutions. They, they fall through the cracks of rating agencies. Uh, Bloomberg won't have them. Uh, you know, basically there is no uh, way to get this information. Whereas for sovereign bonds of advanced countries, there's much more information. Have the Chinese been willing to renegotiate debt to forgive debt? So in the past, they, they have done so in multiple cases, more than 100 cases, in fact. Um, but the uh, approach was case by case. So um, they would renegotiate with individual debtor countries. They did not take part in these coordinated debt relief initiatives uh, to which other uh, government lenders uh, took part in, or the IMF or the World Bank took part in. China was kind of the side, did its own deals. And most of these deals were actually maturity extensions. So a, you know, basically um, uh, lengthening of uh, the debt uh, uh, maturity, but not actual debt forgiveness like we've seen for uh, the Paris Club governments. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, whether um, you know they will change that approach and be part of a more global coordinated uh, initiative and whether they will agree to face value debt right now. So that's the big, these are the big questions. Are these debts in dollars? Because there's a question if they, if they are, how are they able to remain hidden and avoid U.S. scrutiny? So they are in U.S. dollars. Uh, I think the U.S. government, uh, you know, has not, uh, to my knowledge at least, tracked uh, these, these, these lending activities themselves. Uh, what scrutiny has come from the academic side. So there have been uh, very important attempts by, uh, you know, teams in the United States, Aid Data, or Zeiss Kari, um, where researchers have invested years and years of putting together all these lending information uh, on Chinese activities and loans abroad. Um, and that has, uh, you know, added a lot of transparency and our study goes in, in that same direction in trying to shed light in this very, on this very opaque um, um, like lending activity that 